So this is part four in our final study in the book of Thessalonians, our final study in chapter five. Uh, that's where you get the part four from of our studies, our study entitled The Appearing Church. We're going to hop right in today. And point number one is this complete sanctification for you. And it says in verse 23, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And here in this verse, we see Paul right off the bat addressing really what has been referred to as the trichotomy of mankind, spirit, soul, and body. You know, in psychology or in humanism, they teach a dichotomous view that is broken down into two parts, uh, the, the, the spirit and the soul or the consciousness of the intellect and the physical body. They teach that those things are the two parts of, of your nature, uh, your consciousness and your physical body. In John chapter 3, Verse 3 in the New Living Translation, Jesus told Nicodemus, he said, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, we know that the kingdom of God is in heaven. And I think that we would all say unanimously, if I had to choose between going to hell or going to heaven, I would pick go to heaven. Jesus said, you will not see heaven unless you are born again. And for a lot of people, and even people that have grown up in church culture, they have no idea what it means to be born again. You know, some would even say, you know, I'm a Christian, but I'm not one of those born agains, as if it were a derogatory thing. You know, like those, you know, Bible thumping, uh, conservative, biblical worldview type of churchgoers. See, as a Christian... We have the view of the trichotomy of man, not just this split dichotomy of consciousness and physical body, but rather we see the trichotomy as we have put our faith in Jesus. Our spirit has been made alive, made alive through faith in Jesus. That which was dead has been raised. And Paul writes of this in Ephesians 2 verse 1. It says, and you... He made alive who were dead in trespasses and in sins. And this is one of the most, I think, profound and powerful statements in the entire Bible. You, he made alive. God is the giver of life, and in him we have life abundantly. The abundance of life is not found in a world where life runs out. It's not found in the physical universe, but rather in a kingdom that is eternal in the heavens. And God gave us physical life as he created us. As it says in Psalm 139, it says, Your eyes, verse 16, saw my substance being yet unformed. And in your book, they all were written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. That the Lord saw you before you were even born, and he knew exactly what you were going to be like. I think about seeing my children when Ruth was carrying them as she was pregnant, you know, in the ultrasounds and that heartbeat and the little, uh, the blood circulating through the body and how when you read Psalm 139, which we just read, how the Lord says, I saw your substance before it even began to form. What an amazing thing that is. So our very existence, Christian or not, is by God, for he breathed life into us. This is why we value life, for God created it and he values it. This is why we protect life, even fight for life, because it's a precious gift from God. And every person, all of us included, that has ever lived on the earth or is currently alive, will have to come to the point where they acknowledge that God has given them life. Even as God gave life to the first man, Adam, as it says in Genesis 2, 7, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. So God breathed life into you and into your family, into your non-Christian friends, the boss that you may not like and even the person that bothers you, God breathed life into them. He created mankind, 
and God alone is the giver of life. Yet there is something more valuable than a temporal physical life, and that is the eternal spiritual life. When we read in Ephesians that he made us alive, it's implied that you were dead. It even says you he made alive who were dead in your trespasses and in your sins. But even before reading the second half of that verse, you would imply, well, if I was made alive, what was I before I was made alive? He states that we, before Christ, before faith in him, were dead spiritually. We had fallen from that original state of the creation of mankind, and mankind slipped down that slide of sin, missing the mark of God's holy, righteous standards, and thus death entered the world. You he made alive who were dead, which in the Greek language, that word for dead can be translated properly lifeless destitute of life, without life, spiritually dead, and destitute of a life that recognizes and is devoted to God. And here we see the work of the Holy Spirit in our life, in our lives. And as we follow the Lord, it's accomplished in our bodies, in our intellect, and in our spirit. It's important for us as we finish up this chapter <clears throat> it's important for us to understand that our nature is comprised of body, mind, and spirit. It's important to understand these three things because they're the types of avenues in which the Holy Spirit will sanctify us and how the devil will attack us. These three areas, as it's been said, of our lives become gateways of temptation from three different worlds. And unless they are all sanctified, we will never be free of danger. See, to be sanctified by the Lord is to be set apart from the world. And the process of sanctification begins in the regeneration of your spiritual nature, being made alive spiritually. You who are dead, he made alive. And it's from that point that spiritual it's from that point of spiritual regeneration. By the power of the Holy Spirit that's at work in your life, that your consciousness, that your body becomes sanctified for every good work. So let's begin with your intellect. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2 from the English Standard Version, it says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God what is good and acceptable and perfect. So here in the Greek language, do not be conformed means do not fashion oneself or one's mind or one's character to the patterns of the world. It says we're to be conformed to the image of God's son, Jesus. Now you might feel fine in your body and you might feel fine in your spiritual nature, but what about the thoughts that are popping in your head? You know, there's three avenues, as I mentioned, for the enemy to attack, body, mind, and spirit. But the Holy Spirit sanctifies all three of those things that you are comprised of. The Holy Spirit works in conforming us into the image of his son, Jesus. And see, if we have the same form as Jesus, if we have the same form as Jesus, then how do we reconcile our Christianity or, or our faith with world views apart from a biblical worldview? Those that have rejected Christ. See, the answer is we cannot. This is the epitome of one of those things falling under the heading of irreconcilable differences. To be conformed to the world is to estrange yourself from Christ. And there are no middle grounds. There are no middle areas. In Matthew 6, 24, it says, Jesus speaking, no one can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one and love the other, or else he'll be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot serve the true and living God and go in this direction and serve a false God and go in the opposite direction at the same time. You cannot do it. So when Paul writes in Romans that we're not to fashion ourselves after the things of the world, the world, the word world is used in the Greek language as this. It can literally mean a period of time or an age. 
I think this is especially important for us today because if you look back at what moral norms were over the last 400 years, they have changed drastically. And if you thought that because culture accepted something back then that would have been considered moral, that you were okay, you, and if you were not living according to God's word, but according to what might have been a more moralistic society, you are no longer transformed. You are conforming to the things of this world. And the danger is, as he says, the world in any period of time, you will see a change take place. You will see this constant vacillation between what is acceptable and what is not acceptable in the world's standards. And if you are constantly trying to fit into what the world says is okay, you will never have stability. You will actually find yourself in contradictory places of your life because it might have been that last year you were okay and this year you're not okay. So you need to change. And I find this very fascinating because it deals really with the immutable truths of God regardless of the changes of time and culture. Who God was yesterday is the same as <laughs> is the same that he is today and the same that he will be tomorrow. And you will always know where you stand. What was right will always be right. What was wrong will always be wrong. It will never, ever change regardless of what happens in the world around us. And that's why it's so important as followers of Jesus and really what my mission is, is to teach you to have a biblical worldview, that you study the scriptures, you apply it to your life, you have a personal relationship with God, and that everything that you do is viewed through that lens of the Bible. What does God's word say? See, what our society may call progressive is really regressive. We could even just call it progressively evil. Meaning that the values over time change within culture, but regardless of those changes, God's truth remains the same for you and me. It might be legislated evil. That's still not acceptable to God. So I serve God Almighty. I follow his precepts, his commandments. I know that they will never change. And there I find great stability in my life. There I find my moral compass. There I find instruction on how I can live a life that is pleasing to the Lord. And that's what we want. So Paul says, be transformed. And you remember that word from sixth grade science class, metamorphosis. That's where we get our English word, metamorphosis. This transformation that takes place takes us from being against God and dead in our trespasses and in our sins and transforms us into a new creation in Christ. See, the supernatural man or woman, meaning that you've been made alive spiritually, doesn't live conformed to the world, though he has every right and every natural ability to do so. You and me have every right and every ability to live according to the lusts of the flesh. We have everything that we need to be against God. We were born with it. That's our natural life. Yet for the man that has been born again, as Jesus told Nicodemus, as Jesus himself said, you must be made alive spiritually. The man or the woman that has been born again has been made alive spiritually. And then this person, you, has the unique, the unique set apart from the world ability that is not natural to man, but rather supernatural to live a life that is holy and pleasing to the Lord. What an amazing thing that is. That we have been given not only the right to be called sons or daughters of the king, but we've been given the unique ability to live holy and pleasing unto the Lord. And that word, metamorphosis, that transformation that takes place is where we go from, you know, remember looking at that little caterpillar into a beautiful butterfly after it comes out of its cocoon and you go from this little inchy worm to a beautifully winged uh, creature. 
You go from ooh to like ah. And really that's the case. You go from ooh and sin to ah in Christ. And it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. I can't tell you what a blessing that scripture has been in my life. Because remember, in body, mind, and spirit, there are three avenues that the devil will attack us in our thoughts, our physical nature, and in our spirituality. Once we've been made alive, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we have the ability to keep our emotions and our thoughts in check and what we do with our physical bodies to be pleasing to the Lord. We'll get to that in just a moment. But this idea of being a new creation in Christ, it means you are not the same person. That the moment you put your faith in Jesus, and maybe you're even here today or watching online or will listen to this or watch this later, and you do not have faith in Jesus, the moment that you ask the Lord, God, to forgive you of your sins and you put your faith in Jesus instantaneously, you are forgiven of your sins. You have been now granted access into heaven for eternity. You have not only had those two amazing things, but now you have the Holy Spirit indwelling you, living inside of you, and now giving you that connection with the God who created you and also the power to overcome temptations. You know, during the Renaissance period, the word transform suggested a change in the basic nature, a change in a basic nature that just seemed miraculous. And I can personally attest to this, as I'm sure you can as well, that when you see the transformation that takes place in the life of someone that puts their faith in Jesus, it is truly miraculous. I mean, have you ever just asked the question, like, who are you? What happened to the belligerent man that used to live here? What happened to the self-centered, egotistical woman who used to live here? Who are you? Hey, I don't know what to tell you, but I put my faith in Jesus and I'm a new creation in Christ. And the old life, my old ways, they are gone. They are done. That's not who I am any longer. And not only am I a new creation, but all the guilt and regret that I have associated with my life of sin that had separated me from God, I have now been free from all of it. And I have a personal relationship with the Lord. And because of that transformation, we are able to have our intellect fueled by the Holy Spirit. By which we may, interestingly enough, because this has been a building block of a study, that we're able to test all things and hold fast to what is good and abstain from every appearance of evil. As we looked at previously in 1 Thessalonians 5 verses 21 and 22 where he writes, test all things, hold fast what is good, abstain from every form of evil. So the Lord sets us apart in our spirit by making us alive spiritually. He sets us apart in transforming the way that we think. The way that we think. That's miraculous in and of itself because we know how the, uh, uh, like neurologically, how our brain makes pathways through repetition. We know that, hey, I've done this my whole life. It's just second nature. I don't have to think about it, and I, I just do that. And then all of a sudden, there becomes a new path or even a roadblock on the previously traveled path that causes us to go in a different direction in the way that we think. So when I used to respond intellectually to something in a way that was displeasing to God, the Holy Spirit is now overriding because I've subjected even my thoughts to the lordship of Jesus in my life, that now the way that I think, the way that I process information, and the way that I even communicate and live my life based upon what I feel and what I think has now been changed by the Holy Spirit. What an amazing thing that is, because there are many of us even today that have come from a place where our thoughts were our worst enemy. And maybe there's even some revisitation of those things, but then we battle it out and we find ourselves victorious because we rely on the Holy Spirit to help us through those things. 
But the Lord not only makes us alive spiritually and sanctifies us so that we're no longer dead in trespasses and sins, he does so also intellectually in the way that we think and the way that we process things. He does so as well in our physical bodies. Again in Romans, but the previous verse to what we read, chapter 12, verse 1, he says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies. So in verse 2, he talked about the mind, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed. Have that metamorphosis take place where you go from thinking like the world to thinking like Christ, having the mind of Christ. He says, now present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. So we're sanctified in our spirit, in our minds, and in our bodies. And as we recognize that our physical bodies are to be subjected, even as our intellect to the lordship of Jesus Christ in our lives, we then carry out thoughts, carry out emotions in our physical bodies that are to bring glory and honor to God as a living sacrifice. So Paul is saying, I present this issue. And I beg you, or I beseech you, that you would present your bodies to God. There are a whole lot of ways that you can defile and taint your mind and your body. Both were created by God. Both were given to you as a gift. And as you place your faith in Jesus, now the Holy Spirit has taken that fallen state that sinful fallen state and has made you alive in your thoughts, has made you alive in your spirit. And now as you conduct your life in the physical universe, may it be indicative of those two things being made alive spiritually in my heart, in my mind, in my spirit. You know, I hear all the time and we see it and it's kind of one of those common things now. Well, you'll hear, you'll, you'll hear people say, well, you know what? It's my body. I can do what I want with it. Yes, that's true. It is your body. You can do what you want with your body. And you have a choice to either honor God with your body or dishonor him with it. You have every right. And God has given you this common grace, whether you're a follower of Jesus or not, that you've been given a physical body that you can either honor the Lord or dishonor him with. But interestingly, because of what it says in Romans 12, that it's by the mercies of God it's by the mercies of God. Would you, would you look at that again? If you happen to turn to Romans 12, 1, it says, I, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, present your body. It's by the mercy of God that we can even come in our sinful fallen state and say, Lord, I am presenting everything that I am to you. See, none of us can come to the Lord with an idea or the heart of, man, God is getting such a hookup right now with me presenting myself to him. Man, God is going to be so blessed that I finally came around. No, listen, you're blessed. And it's because of God's mercy to you that you can even come with your fractured life, your mistakes, your failures, your sin, your bad thoughts, your tainted emotions, and say, Lord, here I am. Whatever you want to do, have your way, be my Lord, be my Savior. It's the mercy of God found alone through, through your personal faith in Jesus that enables you to be even in the place that you are right now. Don't ever forget that. Yet by the mercies of God can literally be understood by the compassion of God. So, in the context of what we're saying supplementally for this section, Romans 12, why would Paul tell the people that he's writing to that they could present themselves to God because he's compassionate to them? See, by the mercies of God or because God's compassionate, present your body to him. I personally believe that Paul would say this because of the things that these people may have gone through. And I would say that we even have this recorded for us to read today in our own Bibles for the things that we've gone through so that we might realize how compassionate God is for us. 
We have fallen so far from where God intended us to be as his creation. And people feel jaded. They feel dirty because of the things that they've gotten their bodies involved with. And we many times fail to understand that our bodies, that our bodies are connected to our thoughts, our emotions, and our spirit. So wherever you may be at today, you can come to God with who you are right now. Not go clean yourself up and be a better person for X amount of days and then come back to God. No, you can come to God right now in your home, on your patio, watching this on your tablet or your phone, or sitting on the grass in Orchard Hills. You can come to the Lord just as you are, and he will have compassion on you. Listen to what is described of Jesus in Matthew chapter 9, verse 36. It says, when Jesus saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. In Matthew 14, 14, it says, and when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude and he was moved with compassion for them and he healed their sick. God is moved with compassion for your situation, for who you are. Even those of you that have lived your entire life against God as an enemy, Maybe there was a point in your life where you believed in God and then something terrible happened and then you became a professing atheist or an agnostic and, and you've had that point where you felt that God let you down and so you went in the completely opposite direction. But if you're here and you're listening to this right now, I want you to know that God has seen everything. He saw your substance being yet unformed. He knew all about the days of your life. He was not surprised by any of your mistakes or any of your sin. He is not surprised that you went off the rails. He is filled with compassion for you. And as a loving heavenly father, his arms open, his arms are open wide, welcoming you home at any moment that you would so choose to decide to repent and turn from your sin and to seek the Lord. So as Paul says, present your bodies, this is the present tense in grammar. That tense or form of the verb that expresses action or being in the present time as right now, I'm speaking or I'm standing or even something that exists at all times as something that is good, something that is always to be preferred over something that's bad. This also expresses habits or general truths as, you know, plants spring from the earth or fishes or fish swim or reptiles creep or birds fly. A Christian is to be a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. So God has saved us from the power of sin, from its penalty. And in 1 Corinthians 3, 16 through 17, it says, do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. You're the temple of the Holy Spirit. God dwells inside of you as a follower of Jesus. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 15 through 16, it says, But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, God says, Be holy as I am holy. And so back in 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, may the God of peace himself sanctify you, set you apart completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So God, our God of peace, who has granted us peace, is the one at work in our sanctification. Remember, sanctification is just the setting apart of your life from the world and from those that are headed to destruction. And see, our end game, if you will, as a follower of Jesus, the final result is just to be completely set apart from the world. Conformed completely to Christ. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 21, it says, If anyone cleanses himself from their latter or former life of sin, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, 
means set apart and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. And because it's not you that are sanctifying, but the Lord that is sanctifying and setting you apart and changing you, and it's the power of his Holy Spirit that is at work in you, you will find yourself blameless in the sight of God, not because of what you have done, but because of what God has done for you. And when Jesus comes, as we've studied uh, the rapture of the church in 1 Thessalonians, when he comes for his church, you will be found covered by the forgiveness of sin found through Jesus Christ. And if that's not something to be thankful about, I don't know what is. Because there are often times where we don't feel very much like Christ. Or maybe we had made a mistake or fallen into sin or thought a bad thought or carried out that action or whatever it might be. We can fall back on that the Lord is at work in us. And he is faithful to complete that work, which leads us to point number two today, which is this, complete faithfulness to you. Point number one was complete sanctification for you. Point number two is complete faithfulness to you. And it says in verse 24, he who calls you is faithful, who will also do it. Sometimes, Sometimes we lose our way as Christians in that we become discouraged and, you know, we're, maybe we're discouraged because of where we may be at in our life or our spiritual journey. We're thinking, man, I didn't think I was going to be like this this far down the road. You know, I thought I'd be in a completely different spot. I didn't know I'd be wrestling with such things still. And we can find ourselves discouraged. But may I just simply remind you today <laughs> that God is completely faithful to you. And he is completely faithful in completing the work that he has begun in you. He has not stopped working. He is not unaware. He has not taken a break. He has not shelved you. In Philippians 1, 6, it says, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. So let me ask you, are you persuaded of this? Do you believe in that? Are you yielded to it? Sometimes we just need to be reminded, maybe even today, that yes, God is still on the throne and he is still at work. God is in the process of sanctifying you. And in my limited time of, time of living on the earth, I have found it very interesting that God, is, God has a very interesting way of persuading us to such extents that he wins us over to his will. Because as the Lord's ways are often not our ways, often will the case be that God will reveal certain things that in our lives need to change. This has to go. Or He'll reveal things such as, hey, there are certain qualities that you need to acquire. You are missing these things in your life. You need to start exercising them. But remember, the good work that has been started in your life is God making you like his son, Jesus. That's the work that has begun in your life the moment you placed your faith in Jesus. And what an amazing thing to say that's taking place in your life. I'm being made more like Jesus. And honestly, if we're to be very real and frank, sometimes it takes some very serious persuasion for us to understand that God's ways are better than our ways. It doesn't matter who you are, God's ways are always better. If you think you know better than God, please just save yourself some hassle and say, Lord, your ways are better. I will defer to you. And you will find yourself in a good spot because you do have the freedom to make your own choices. But for the woman or the man that decides to follow Jesus, you will never be comfortable not dwelling in the center of God's perfect will for your life. We talked about how the Holy Spirit can be grieved. The Holy Spirit can be quenched. The Holy Spirit can be resisted, blasphemed. For those of us that resist the Holy Spirit, it will only bring you to a point of frustration. You know, the Lord told Paul before he was called Paul, his name was Saul and he was persecuting the church. And he said, Saul, it's hard for you to kick against the goads. For us in 2020, we're like, what in the world are goads? 
Well, for those of you that have ever owned oxen, which I'm sure it's many of you, uh, what they would have is so that the oxen wouldn't kick back against the farmer, there were these sharp little spikes that were back there. And if you wanted to resist what the farmer was telling you to do, then there would be a painful, somewhat painful reminder that that's not the way to go. And you can try to resist the Holy Spirit. You can try to do things your own way, but you will never, if you're truly a person that has, that has, if you're truly a person that has put their faith in Jesus, you will not be happy in sin. You will not be happy outside of God's will. The Holy Spirit actually at work in your life and because God is faithful to complete the work that he started in you, it will bring extreme frustration. But some people need to learn the hard way. I know there was times in my life that I had to learn the hard way and finally be persuaded that God's ways are the right ways. After I had been through the very situations that have caused me to see just for myself how true to his word God really is. <laughs> Now, wrestling with the truths of God's word is normal because it would seem that the world and our own reasoning will hurl so many viable reasons as to why God's word doesn't apply to our situation. And we'll go back and forth with what God's word says and we'll say, well, you know, God's word says that, but I feel this. God's word states that, but they're saying this. And we can have a difficult time being persuaded that God is true to his word and that he works and completes that work. Paul said that he was persuaded. And God has a marvelous way of persuading us that his word is truth because it always works itself out to be that way. And I'm convinced and I've been persuaded that God is faithful to me, faithful to me even when I'm not faithful to him. Complete faithfulness to you. In 2 Timothy 2.13, it says, If we are faithless, he, God, remains faithful because he cannot deny himself. You know, all it takes is just a little honesty and a little less delusions of spiritual grandeur to check ourselves. You know, you try not to lose your temper, but the root of your anger still remains. You try not to lust in your flesh, but the root of your lust still remains. You try not to be so selfish and self-centered, but the root of your self-centeredness still remains. All the things that you want to do, you don't do, and all the things that you don't want to do, you do do. And it is. Do do. It's sin. Listen to what Paul says in Romans 7, 18 through 19 and 24 and 25. He says, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good, I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil I will not to do, that I practice. And he says, oh, wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from the body of death? And then he says in verse 25, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. And he realizes that his flesh serves sin. I wonder how many of us can relate to what Paul just said in Romans 7. Man, I, I want to do the right thing, but I'm not. I don't want to do the wrong thing, but I am. And it's at those points in our spiritual journey that it's hard to believe that God is still willing to work with us and even work in us. See, the beginning of a new work is exciting. It's like, wow, wow, God is really on the move. Look what is happening. Isn't it just amazing? God, you are so good. Hallelujah. I mean, beginning a work is exciting. Finishing a work, man, that's fantastic but it's the middle between the beginning and the end that is the struggle. Maybe you're here today and you're saying, Lord, you know, I've been waiting on your promises and I still don't see them. Possibly you haven't seen the type of maturity or growth that you expected to have at this particular juncture in your spiritual journey. Maybe you've made some rookie mistakes. Maybe you've been walking with the Lord for a long time, but you just blow, blew it royally and you're discouraged and you're condemned. Maybe you had a great track record. Man, for years, nothing. 
smooth sailing, no problems, resisting temptation, but now I've given in. I've made a mistake. And you may think that God cannot use you anymore because you were, quote, quote, the type of person he was looking for, but now you're not. Listen, the Lord has so many different ways that he can work in accomplishing the very thing that you're persuaded of and believe in and are yielded to, not resisting the work of the Holy Spirit. You know, this last year has been filled with a lot of challenges. I think it goes without saying. Quite frankly, I think people are just sick of hearing it. Yeah, we all get it. But then personally, you know, I've had a lot of inconvenient things take place in my life. Like inconvenient, just pastor, no pastor, just as a, as a normal human being, things that really were inconvenient. Quite frankly, they were a bust. And I couldn't understand for the life of me why this stuff just kept happening over and over and over again to me. I'm like, what on earth is happening? This is ridiculous. Never in the history of man has this happened so many times. And I started to see that the Lord was in all of those inconveniences. I started to recognize that anything that I viewed as a put out was actually put in by the Lord. And I had a complete paradigm shift that every single thing, as the Lord says in his word, that as a man plans his ways, the Lord directs his steps, that even the greatest inconveniences and challenges and put outs and you name it, as a follower of Jesus, if you're yielded to the work that he is doing in your life, will be found, will be found to work together for your good. And so yielding to the work of God in every area of our life and to any method that he would so choose to employ to accomplish that work is actually a sign of your spiritual maturity and spiritual wisdom that God has allowed you to exercise. In James 3, 17, it says, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, then gentle. And then it says wisdom that comes from above is willing to yield Full, t- full of mercy and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy. And one of the most amazingly wise things that we can do as followers of Jesus is to yield to the Holy Spirit. The one that is going to present you blameless at the coming of Jesus. The one that is faithful to complete the work which he started in you. And so I hope today that you find encouragement that the Lord has not given up on you. You may feel that he has, but nothing could be further from the truth. You didn't catch God off guard when you sinned. God wasn't in heaven on his throne going, oh man, you totally caught me off guard on that one. He sees it. He knows all things, sees all things, hears all things. So you can come to the Lord because he is compassionate and he cares for you. This week, we're heading into Thanksgiving. This week, we're heading into a week that can be painful and lonely, or it can be a blessing and something that causes us to rejoice in the Lord. I pray that it's the latter for all of us. Paul concludes this letter, this first letter, with saying, Brethren, pray for us. Pray for each other. Pray for your leaders. Pray for your mayors. Pray for your city council members. Pray for your police chiefs and officers and fire, uh, fire departments that we have even have the Orange County you know, Fire Authority right here. The guys that had saved our homes and saved our church. Pray for the leaders in the church. Pray for each other. It says, greet all brethren with a holy kiss. Now, you got to understand, Middle Eastern culture presented this a little bit differently because I had weird guys over the years be like, hey, I'm going to greet you with a holy kiss. I'm like, no, you're not. Can't tell you, we had some real strange birds that would come on Monday nights at Calvary Chapel of Costa Mesa thinking that they were going to greet women with a holy kiss. I'm like, no, you're not. Out of here. This is talking about this relationship that defines holiness in your interpersonal relationships with your brothers and sisters in Christ. There is a respect there. There is a love there. 
and there is a holiness that is present in the way that you communicate with them, the way that you may even communicate about them when they're not there. He says in verse 27, I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read to all the holy brethren. So the church, let them all read it. Let them all study it. And he concludes with verse 28, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. And today we conclude this chapter in this book. But our prayer for you has been that upon studying this book, you'll start a new chapter in your life that maybe you need to turn the page on something of the past and allow the Lord to start penning the new chapter of your life. Maybe getting rid of the old things couldn't come soon enough. And because of God's work of complete sanctification for us and his complete faithfulness to us, Today, I think we can conclude our service leading into Thanksgiving with great cause for praise and thanksgiving. And so what I'd like to do now is, right here in the middle, we have a microphone that is set up. And I had mentioned this earlier, where I thought that it would just be a real special thing, a real blessing for the church. That if the Lord has stirred your heart, and we have you know, a good amount of people here today. So, you know, just a five, 10 second thing to maybe just say, hi, I'm so-and-so and and this is what I'm thankful for. And if the Lord has put something on your heart that you would like to share, then just make your way up to this uh, microphone here and uh, just share what the Lord has put on your heart to be thankful for. One, two, check one. Hi everyone, I'm Tony Wynn and I'm uh, thankful for God's love, grace, and mercy, because I don't deserve it. And I'm thankful for him always providing and answering prayers in his time and his own way. God bless. No 20 minutes, Jonathan. Good morning. Uh, I just want to say uh, how much we're so thankful to the Lord uh, this, month, uh, this year, especially. Uh, as you all know that my daughter Jennifer uh, married last year and in April this year she gave birth to a beautiful miracle baby named Madeline. Through this baby, um, she brought so much joy and I know that this is from the Lord. And even though right now um, Marianne and I uh, taking care of them, nurturing them. And it's just uh, amazing. Uh, we are so blessed and we just want to thank God for that. Thank you. Todd White, um, I, I'm very thankful this year for uh, the Lord's great abundance for our family and um, that we've had really good health for all of our family members. I'm very thankful for that. I'm thankful for my friends and family and obviously Hudson and Shiloh and Seth and that the Lord has always provided for us and we've never had no food on the table or like been out on the streets. I'm thankful for my friends and family, my house, and um, I'm thankful for President Donald Trump for doing such a good job while he was in office. Hope we can get another four years. And um, thank you. My name is Shiloh, and I'm very thankful for everything I have. I'm thankful for my house and my family and all my friends, and that's it. I'm going to try to do this without crying, but those of you know, I was in a really bad car accident at the beginning of March, and I am thankful for my family, for the Lord's healing, for my Vision City Church family, that every single one of my needs have been met. I'm so thankful for complete healing. I'm thankful for our pastor. I'm faithful. I'm thankful for his lovely wife, Ruth. And I just want to tell every one of you, thank you for the prayers. 
and I am much better in the back serving you donuts than I am up here. So God bless each of you. Hi, Gary. Hi. Uh, my name's Joanne Lopez. I'm thankful for Vision City Church here in Orange County for Garrett and Ruth and all of you. And I'm thankful for all the beautiful, wonderful pastors and evangelists and preachers and teachers. Uh, I'm thankful to the Lord for where we are in the stream of time right now. And I'm thankful for my family. Yes. Mm -hmm. My name is Aaron LaFleur. And I'm thankful that we all here together to congregate in God's presence. You know, we not maybe not be inside, but we still together here to be thankful for. And I'm happy to be here. Hi, I'm Heather LaFleur, and I'm just grateful for our Lord always being with us, giving us everything we need to live in this life. And I'm also thankful for the people that served before us and who are still serving so we could live here and grateful to be working and just uh, have this community here with you guys. So happy Thanksgiving. Hi, I'm Steve Sanchez. And uh you know, the Bible says in everything give thanks, and it also says for everything give thanks. And through COVID, there's been so many inconveniences. And I've watched our pastor, you know, Pastor Garrett, go through some challenges and just the attitude. And it really encouraged me with a new perspective to embrace the opportunities. And so one of the things I'm incredibly thankful for is for all of you. We've been through so much change as a church. And we're meeting outside, and, and the Lord has been so faithful. And my wife, Aubrey, and I, we've thought about just how blessed we are with relationships, how many, how oftentimes you all encourage, support, and how as a body we have come together through a difficult year. Um, and I look forward to 2021. So I'm thankful for all of you and the great work that God is doing through you and how you, you all bless our family. So. Hey guys, uh, my name is Dan. Oh. This is my own mic anyway. Uh, my name is Daniel Hudson. I got to say, I agree with you, so praise the Lord. Uh, so um, actually, the beginning of the pandemic, um, uh, there was a, it was a moment where, you know, before we actually met, it was like months that, we're, that we didn't have church over here. And uh, during that time for a couple of months, like, the enemy was trying to destroy our family and break our family apart. And uh, I, I only told Pastor Garrett this during that time, but I actually shared this last night. And... Uh, uh, during a Friendsgiving, and I uh, hope I didn't get in trouble last night from Gavin, but um, but uh, but there was like a, t a, a moment for a couple months where our family was about to break apart, and uh, where um, the end, and then my my parents were almost filing for a divorce, but out of nowhere, the miracle of God was you know there. The Holy Spirit just like came and poured into our house, and uh, never seen our house being more un in love for Jesus for that, and so. I just thank God too that, you know, even to this day, like, you know what, like, even though like it took two months, God always is on the move. God is always doing miracles. His Holy Spirit's always moving no matter what. And sometimes we, sometimes we can't, we're just like questioning God's like, hey, God, where are you? But God, timing's always perfect. He knows what's best for us. And so um, we just want to thank the Lord for that. Just bring our family together this year because I know the pandemic has been, crazy for a lot of us and um but uh, and also to um never thought i would still be here after for about um almost six years now to about the time like you know since vision started and so thankful for pastor garrett and ruth and uh everybody here and uh actually i consider you guys family thank you guys love y'all hey guys I'm ryan um so uh, this seems kind of obvious, but obviously I'm, I'm, I'm thankful for my family and, and just the unbelievable ways that God has blessed us. And um, I think one thing in particular that re I was reminded of during the message today was that um, even when we start to stray from the Lord and even in those times when we have little faith and, and um, little focus on the Lord, He absolutely uh, will leave the 99 to come and get us and, and to shake us up using just various circumstances in our lives. And um, I really felt that this year 
the Lord did that with me and, and our family personally that, um, you know, when there was times when I was being a dummy, uh, the Lord would just shake me up and remind me uh, of who I am in Christ. And uh, I'm just thankful that God does that in our lives and that he loves us enough uh, to do that for us. So thanks. I am thankful for Jesus and the Bible and for all the people. I am thankful for God and everybody here and for Vision City Church. Hi guys, my name is Tom. Um, just so thankful for my church and all you guys. I started with Pastor Chuck coming out of Catholic Church, and I loved the teaching of Pastor G, and I met him when he was very young, <laughs> and uh, he said he was starting a church out here, and I go, and he invited us, Judy and I, to come out and start planning it, and it's just been awesome, because it's verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and I just want to thank you guys. I love you guys, and I love Vision Chitty Church, because we're just <clears throat> following Jesus, and during this time, that's what we need. And uh, I thank you for loving Judy and uh, just stepping up and being there for me and her family. And uh, I want to thank and appreciate all the kids because that's what Jesus really thrives through. You, you just saw it before me. And they're going to carry it on through generations. And it's beautiful. You know, we're going through this COVID and it's not what, it's not the end of it because it's just a warning, I believe, that God's saying, believe in my son, Jesus because he's close, he's right around the corner, I'm, and I'm feeling it and I'm seeing it. I, I've had a lot of division with friends who are maybe left or whatever, but uh, I, I, I guess that's God, I just heard it today, that maybe that's what God wants, to get away from those kind of people unless they're coming towards Jesus. But I, I used to want to save the oceans, and God taught me through Calvary Chapel and, and, chapter, and Pastor Chuck and... Pastor G, that I'm not a fisherman of men. I'm not a fisherman of fish. God bless you all. Thank you. Okay. I am in your fall who? I don't say drum. Yeah, all the person in it would be so good. Thanks, Trevor. Thank you. All right, at this time, I'm going to invite the worship team to come back up on the stage. Let's all stand, and we're going to close out just singing a song of worship to the Lord to send us on our way. And I just want to say how thankful I am uh, for you guys and for being so flexible, for being so committed to following the Lord as it is really required of us as followers of Jesus to be the hands and feet, to be the church. And thank you so much for being here today. We want to just ask that... Uh, if you do need, again, any, any kind of help over Thanksgiving, would you please uh, head over to the info table and we can get some uh, uh, contact information for, from you and uh, make sure that we can help out any way that we can. And also, this week, uh, just uh, really, really think of and ponder and reflect upon how good God has been to us. He has blessed us abundantly. And we have so much to be thankful for. And so today, guys, may the Lord bless you. May He keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. May he be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace in Jesus' name. God bless you. Have a great rest of your Sunday and happy Thanksgiving. Nothing can separate Even if I ran away Your love never fails I know I still make mistakes, but you have new mercies for me every day. Your love never fails. You say the same through the ages. Your love never changes. There may be pain in the night, but joy comes in the morning. And when the ocean
oceans rage I don't have to be afraid Because I know that you love me Your love never fails 